forward to all my talks. Hello and welcome. Drupal 8 Security Tips and Tricks. You all are here at the Stanford Drupal Camp, believe it or not. Amazing, right? Uh, I do ask during this talk if you would please hold questions to the end. I've got a lot of material and I often answer the questions that people have asked of me before. So that'll be in the talk. My name is Nerdstein. I also go by Adam Bergstein. I am the Associate Director of Engineering at Civic Actions. I work with Heather. I have a Master's of Science in Information Systems and Security from Penn State University. I'm the Drupal 8 maintainer of a bunch of different modules, services, taxonomy menu, password policy, key encrypt, field encrypt, file encrypt, uh, multi-select, a whole bunch of different ones. Um, they're becoming too numerous for me to count and I'm becoming a little too overwhelmed. If you're interested in participating, come find me. Hey, Stanford, first and foremost, big fan. Love what you're about, love what you do in the world. You challenge people to think big. I like that. We all should do that. You've got someone like Elon Musk. He kind of has something a little bit to do with Stanford, and he founded a couple famous companies. He's a little wealthy, so he's got Tesla, he's got SpaceX, and you know he's doing big things in the world. And you've got these guys here, and you may not recognize them from back when they went to Stanford. This is Larry Page and Sergey Brin from Google, right? And you know they kind of did something big too. And I want to challenge you all, as a community, people in Drupal and otherwise, to recognize that we all solve big problems. We do that. And we have impact on the world, too. It's a great thing. There are many people that are here today that I personally look up to for the work that they do in the world. You've got Greg, got Heather, and there's many more. There's pictures to prove it. So let's talk a little bit about security. First and foremost, Drupal 8 itself is only a year and a half old. Amazing. Imagine its potential. Imagine what it is capable of doing when this thing is three years old or when this thing is four years old. Drupal 7's been around forever, right? Imagine if that has the long tail and Drupal 8 makes it that long. Well, it probably won't, but imagine that. It'll be insane, right? I think the future is looking really good. I like what I'm seeing. The next bit of information I wanna share with you is that security is extremely hard. So why is that? First and foremost, Things change constantly. They are always changing. There's always new attacks. There's always new vectors. There's always new vulnerabilities, right? And the solutions to patch those vulnerabilities and fix the security issues are always evolving as well. It's hard to keep up with. And you must secure everything. And that's one thing in this talk that we're going to really explore. You have to secure your application, your infrastructure, and the worst part, your users. Oh, I'm so sorry. The hardest problems and things that you will solve will improve security and don't affect usability. If there's one takeaway, that is the hardest thing to do. But conversely, you also have to know that if you make something hard, it's equally as hard to exploit it. So you have to make it hard. And any good security person will tell you that you'll never make a great solution if you don't understand the problem that you're trying to solve. So as part of this talk, do not go and just enable every module that I have in my deck. It's not going to get you what you want. I promise you that. So just be discretional, understand what you're trying to do, and we're gonna have some context to help out with that. All right, so a little overview of the talk. First, we're gonna start with core. Next, we're gonna look at other hardening techniques. We're gonna look at auditing, authentication, encryption, DevOps. 
your environment, and questions at the end. We've got a lot to go, folks, and I promise you I will be brief, and I hope you enjoy it. Let's look at Core. Drupal 8 Core has many new improvements that impact security itself directly. I likey a lotty. Okay, yeah, big deal. Let's evaluate a few. First and foremost, Twig. This is for all my front end folks in the room. Woo, woo, woo. All right, auto escaping of variables past the templates. Folks, you do not need to worry about this anymore. Hooray. It happens by default. They've also removed the PHP filter, and Twig doesn't even really support this that elegantly. You have no more custom PHP in your templates. You all should be thrilled about that. I know I, I've seen so many people, front-end folks, just bang their head against the wall because they have to write PHP in Drupal 7 templates. I understand, right? All right, next, PHP info, uh, input filter. And we already talked about this a little bit, but, you know, hey, Bad smells are bad for business, all right? When things stink, it just has a rotting effect in everything that you do. And PHP filter was removed from core, thank God. You should not be allowing your content editors to type PHP into a node. Are you guys crazy? Well, you guys aren't. You're here, right? So... You, you have no idea how many potential vulnerabilities that you've eliminated just by removing that tool alone. Awesome. All right, trusted hosts. Your Drupal system can be a heck of a lot smarter if you associate it with a specific domain. And that enables it to mediate requests and prevent potential spoofing attacks that could happen against your Drupal site. Fascinating, right? Now this one, arguably someone would say, well, why do you have new development constructs inside of your security talk? Well, first, I'm a programmer. That happens. The next thing is I will say that there are many cool new things about the programming that actually makes it a lot more secure or can extend security a lot more easier, right? So let's take a look at it. First and foremost, plugin systems. Any module that you develop, core, contrib, whatever, what have you, can support any plugin system that can extend its automatic out-of-the-box behavior by any other module. And you will see how I've used that in some of the modules that I develop. So in short, tools can be developed that can apply any of your needs from a security perspective or, or otherwise. They can extend what a basic module can do. So it's a really handy API for extending something that could do basic behaviors and then add your stuff in. Composer, so Greg gave, I mean, a fantastic talk on how to use Composer in an elegant and sexy way, props. And so I would claim that uh, the inclusion of Composer into the Drupal community improves security exponentially. Why? Because you're getting off of the island. There are so many people in the world that are using and creating tools that we should be benefiting from, right? Do you agree? I want to benefit from them. And otherwise, you're also going to become more uh, robust and diverse as a developer because if you use their tools, you're going to give back to them whenever you find that it's not working the way that you want it to. So you're you know, not just going to be a Drupal developer. You might be a Twig developer or a Symfony person. Who knows? But all good stuff. So I want to thank all the people who built all these cool new things in Core that I like to leverage. And I'm going to turn around and we're going to start talking about Contrib a little bit. And by the way, there is so much more stuff that I barely, I didn't even mention uh, that are security related that are in Drupal 8 Core. If you are interested in more information, Peter Wolanin, uh, who works at Acquia and their engineering team, he gave a Drupal 8 security talk that was all core focused, um, and he gave that at Drupal North. I, can, I have a link at the end of this that I can provide. So let's explore some hardening techniques, and this is really where Contrib comes in a little bit more aggressively. What is a hardening technique? First, it is a method for locking down specific attack vectors in your Drupal system. So you can eliminate vulnerabilities just by restricting what the system does or allows or how it functions. Pretty clear? So, 
When you do that, many, many users often get impacted by reducing the things or forcing them to go through a certain new process that they otherwise uh, might not enjoy, right? And here's your typical user, right? Uh, the screen says, hey, press any key to start. And they're like, oh, wait, I don't see a, a, an, any key on this keyboard, right? So you shouldn't be surprised with that kind of a response that many of the solutions we're going to be exploring here are actually about the user themselves, right? They're probably the biggest vulnerability that you have. Some of which are technical, some of which are not. And getting into any sort of access to a Drupal system, infrastructure, or otherwise can be very dangerous. So let's explore some stuff. Auto logout. First, what's the problem? A user session should be limited to a certain fixed period of time. This module solves that. And not only can you configure that, but for people that have higher level permissions, like administrators, you can configure them to have a shorter window of time that they will be logged out sooner. Session limit. This restricts the number of concurrent se uh, sessions that a user is capable of having. And oh, by the way, just as a quick, quick reminder here, this is a Drupal 8 talk. All of these modules are available today on drupal.org for use on your Drupal 8 site. This is not just 7, although many of them do have 7 versions. So the solution for session limit is basically a configurable way, also by role, to allow uh, the number of active sessions to be defined. Login security. So this one's a bit, um, you know, kind of diverse uh, in nature. Um, there's co a couple problems that are solved commonly with this module. First being that authentication should only be from a certain set of IP addresses. That's really good if you have that <laughs> as a metric. Most organizations don't. Um, you know, unless if you're behind a private firewall and your network administrators have given you an IP, right? Uh, the other problem that this attempts to solve is uh, extending what Core does for flood control. So um, if you have an uh, invalid number of attempts that someone doesn't, you know, fill out their password properly, uh, it'll stop them at, you know, say 10 attempts. And it's more configurable than what Core uh, offers. The set kit module, uh, I, I like to call this one the Swiss Army knife. Um, <laughs> and, and the really cool thing about this module is that it's extremely lightweight to install. If there's one generic thing I would recommend, it might be this. Um, but the problem that it tries to solve is basically through um, response headers. That's really its core strength. And that can help or affect a lot of different types of security problems from cross-site scripting to click jacking, uh, CSRF, and any origin-driven attacks. So if these headers are configured properly, that can improve that security a lot. And uh, this, this is super straightforward to configure as well. It's very lightweight. Uh, we have a couple kind of hardening techniques you know, around bots. So one of the really annoying things is that a robot can just spam the living daylights out of your site. You know, they could create accounts, or they could fill out your contact form. And we need a way of locking that down a bit more. So the honeypot and the uh, CAPTCHA modules provide the tools for doing that. So robots have to go through extra steps to try to understand um, what your form is doing. And if they, say, fill out the honeypot on the form, they're not allowed to submit it. Cool. The results are in, and you are not human. All right, auditing. This is, this is kind of huge. Um, so think for a moment. Let's just pause and kind of reflect for a second. If you ever get hacked, right? Imagine your you know, favorite website, and you, and you just get completely trashed, and there's big Viagra ads all over it or something. Um, would you like more information about what potentially happened in the hack, or would you like less? More, right? So auditing, the whole problem space, is trying to provide as much possible information and logging just as, as much as you possibly can to try to have as much information at your fingertips if it ever goes wrong, right? And that whole space uh, is called digital forensics. It's like trying to like, take 
massive hordes of data and sift through it and analyze it and bake it and come out with some pretty good assumptions about what might have happened or where someone hacked you from or what have you. And so uh, auditing tools also really help with the ongoing state of the Drupal system too. So you can kind of um, see the behaviors of how your site's being used and then maybe build some improvements for security over time, which is nice. So what are some general tips? Um, first, use syslog instead of dblog. Anything that's tied to the system actually has a lot more tools available for auditing and an uh, analysis than Drupal's root database logging system. Uh, and we'll get to that shortly. Um, and it, this is another one here too that you need to understand the problem that you're actually trying to solve because you could go and install every auditing module that's in the world in the planet and your site, you still might not be logging the things that are important to you. So you should try to understand what it is that you want to log in the event that a hack happens because every Drupal site is different, right? And again, log as much data as possible. Log all the things. Site audit. So as a general problem, can, is there any tool available that allows me to scan and report on how secure my site is? Or is it following general best practices, right? And the solution, the uh, site audit module performs a static analysis on Drupal's configuration. And this is kind of nice because uh, we talked about auditing. It stores historical reports. So you can go and see over time if your security is improving. And if you pull down the updates to the module and you do things like that, they may have new attack vectors that they've learned about or that have been committed to the module that you can continue to run and have more proactive security over time. Uh, it's, again, it's no guarantee. This isn't something, this isn't a silver bullet. Um, please do not shoot me if something ever happens and you're, you have this installed. It's not foolproof. Security review, this is one that I, I really like a lot. Um, can your system be evaluated for known security best practices? Very similar to security audit, but um, this one is more of like a, a utility, I would say, that allows you to um, run the auditing. And so it also attempts to go and scan your Drupal system against a known set of vulnerabilities or best practices. So it's very similar in the space of security audit. Uh, and this also stores a report for his, uh, historical purposes. One of the things that I'm working on in my spare time, which doesn't exist, is uh, building a plugin system for this module to allow you to write your own roles of how to um, perform your ongoing audits of security. And right now it doesn't have it. Uh, the login history module. So this is really useful about tracking data around user logins. Again, we said the users are really the critical piece here. So whenever you're tracking uh, when they log in, where they're logging in from, what their user agent is, how they attempted to log in, if it was a reset password link or the straight login form on the site. Uh, it tracks all of this information. It can be configured and um, super useful in case you get hacked because more likely than not, someone's gonna be doing that through a bad password or something. Authentication, this is also a good one. Authentication um, is a space where, again, you're making your users' lives miserable but you're preventing attacks because you're actually making it harder for people to log in. And I know intuitively that might seem like, wow, why would I ever want to do that? But if your users are the primary attack vector or one of the biggest considerations, a little bit of pain on their end can go a long way. And believe me, the, the sheer dollars that can come into getting hacked is unimaginable. Um, so, the point I'm making here is that you may inconvenience folks, but try to imagine a world in which you do get hacked and the concerns that'll come up in, in doing so. Um, kind of remind me, you know, of like a spacesuit, right? Like, oh, uh, hey, I'm protected. I've got my oxygen. I've got all these other things, but goddamn, is this thing crappy, right? Like, man, I can't even walk in this. So two-factor off. This is uh, a module I wrote uh, for Drupal 8. Um, how can I get an additional step, a secondary step of validation 
to verify that the user is who they say they are when they're authenticating. Uh, the solution is a two-factor auth module. Uh, but one interesting thing about this module is this doesn't actually solve the problem. This module is an API. If you just raw install it, it's not going to do anything. So what do you want to install? Well, you might want to install the Google Authenticator module. This was ported by um, one of my Google Summer of Code students uh, that worked with the TFA module. And so they wrote a TFA plugin using a plugin system that is found in the TFA module to write uh, Google's Authenticator. So now you can very easily add a second factor whenever you try to log in that forces users to go use their Google account, get notified via text or whatever, go through Google's authentication as well, and then they pass the gate check. So if you're looking to replace Drupal's login system, and by the way, there was a really great talk for the Stanford folks um, yesterday morning on Shibboleth that was really good. Their, their implementation was completely solid. Um, kudos to them for, for killing it on that one. Um, but Simple SAML PHP Auth is a module in Drupal that associates with a Drupal, or sorry, a community library and composer to bring in uh, this, this great library that enables you to replace Drupal's login system wholesale with a third party uh, authentication provider. So definitely explore that if you want to, uh, say if you have single sign-on, this is a great solution for you. Uh, and that usually is a really good way because uh, you're moving your trust uh, of users to a validated third party system, which is great. Password policy. This was the first Drupal 8 module I developed. Um, yeah, it has, has a special place in my heart. So what, is, what are the problems that it tries to solve? First, how can you force your users to have a strong password, right? If their password is ABC123, chances are they're going to get hacked. So how, do, how can you force them to do strong passwords? And by the way, one of the other interesting things about password policy is you can reset passwords after a given amount of time. And that is super useful too because when you have uh, changing passwords, then you know, if someone does leak some information, you may have a chance of getting on top of that uh, and forcing them to change before they can access anything in the system. And one really cool thing is that password policy has its own plugin system. If you want certain roles applied, that are specific to your organization about how you want your user passwords to be. And this is super popular in the government. They have strict criteria. And guess what? This module allows you to develop that criteria for your use case with its plugin system. The password strength module is a great example of that. Um, who knows uh, Ben Jevens? In the community, his uh, Drupal name is Coltrane. Okay, so he's a great security mind. Um, and I think, I don't know if it was Facebook or Twitter, one of those companies developed this concept of, um, and I always screw this up, XCVBN library. It's, uh, it's actually a, a keychain on your keyboard. <laughs> and what it is, it's a, an entropy metric of how difficult your password is. It runs it through a bunch of different algorithms and all it does is it puts out a number from one to five. Five being the most secure, one being really insecure. And so this is a simple, like a trivially simple way to actually um, have password policy, which it extends password policies API using this library, which was brought in with Composer. You're seeing a trend here, right? And all you do is say, I want my user passwords to be of a score of four or greater. If you pick five, you're going to make their lives completely miserable. But if you pick four and three and up, anything like that, you're getting good passwords with really high uh, entropy that you don't need to worry about you know, um, the specific roles that you know, you're going to force users to go through, which is kind of nice. It's like, hey, hit this score. Okay, so I'm going to keep changing my password until it's difficult enough, and, and they'll be good. All right, so let's explore encryption. To be very clear on this, 
Encryption includes both the data at rest and the channels in which you're communicating. That's a big thing. Some people, I think, only think, oh, if I install encryption services on my Amazon cloud, I'm going to be secure. No. There are many different solutions in encryption that happen across every tier of your infrastructure, from your hosting to your application to even something like a CDN or a web application firewall that would be overarching all of it. So what are some general tips that I have for you on this talk? Well, first, and by the way, I am not an infrastructure person. Heather will tell you, first and foremost, it is not my space. However, Civic Actions, we have some fantastic people who are brilliant about these sorts of things. So they've kind of just, I've gleaned a little bit off of them uh, to help <laughs> with this talk. So some general tips. First and foremost, the lower the level that you solve the problem, the more advantageous it is. So if you can get something from the infrastructure and you have a solution that can cascade through your Drupal system and the application layer, you should do it there. Do not uh, install something that you know, is just on the application layer if you have an alternate solution that you could install on the infrastructure. Use full HTTPS and SSL on your site and for all web traffic. This is be not becoming taboo. People used to think, oh, I only need to secure login form and credit card collection and things that were you know, publicly facing data and that my users want to see the lock on the screen. They want to see it all the time. They're getting over that now. They want to make sure your site is communicating securely constantly. And one of the cool things, if you're looking to do something really low level, is most often um, a lot of hosting and cloud providers offer full disk encryption from the infrastructure. So you can solve that super trivially just by turning it on. Right? We're not talking about some, some big research project here. <laughs> so let's take a look at some of the Drupal specific solutions here, uh, especially ones that I've worked on. Um, first, uh, the key module. So what is the problem? I need a, a secure way to manage all of my system and API keys that exist in Drupal, right? Could be like Google Maps or whatever, any, any API key you could ever imagine. So Key provides um, the ability to store and retrieve keys. And by the way, it has a plugin system. If you want to develop your own way to store and retrieve keys that you think is more secure than anything else that you found, you have the ability to develop it. Encrypt. I need a way to encrypt Drupal application data. So again, Encrypt provides an API that gives you the ability to implement whatever algorithm you ever want to do your encryption. This module only provides the ability to encrypt and decrypt. It is non, doesn't, doesn't care what algorithm you want to use, and it can be highly extended to whatever you want to do. Cool. So what are some Encrypt-based modules that have come out of this, these plugin systems that I've developed in these modules. Well, first and foremost, uh, you may want to change the algorithm in which Encrypt is behaving. You could use Real AES or Diffuse. You have two modules that are available today that you can choose whatever one best meets your needs. Data, maybe you want to encrypt files uh, or you want to encrypt fields in an entity. You have two modules that provide all the hooks and all the operations, works directly with the encrypt module, and you have it immediately in your hands. There are specific use cases. So who's familiar with OwnCloud? Has anyone ever heard of that? Okay. So uh, OwnCloud is like um, kind of like a, uh, a home share, file sharing, I think, type system uh, that works. Um, we developed, we, uh, as a Google Summer of Code project, we took its uh, algorithm and process and applied that to Drupal, and we called it PubKey Encrypt. So it's a really unique way that you can have user-specific encryption uh, for any kind of operation that you might want. Uh, this will only work for certain use cases, so be, just be cautious about that. Um, and our goal is to live long and prosper through encryption. All right, let's take a look at some DevOps. Um, all right, here we go. So, what are some claims I'm going to make? 
you lock down everything in your infrastructure, you have your application and it's killing it, you've installed all the perfect modules you need, all the auditing, and guess what? Your DevOps processes introduce vulnerabilities because they are not rigid enough and you are not being proactive about what is getting into your site. So what are some general tips? Uh, you know, you could definitely talk to Greg later. He's, he's the wizard. But uh, what do I have for you? First and foremost, use code repositories. And for the love of God, do pull requests. There is no reason why someone should not be looking at what changes are going into your site. Do peer review. Just do it. It's so easy. Like, and you get better with it with time, too. <laughs> it's something that you just grow to learn to pick up certain things. And it's really fantastic. So perform that code review, and, and the one word of caution here is pay extra careful attention and scrutiny to anything that is custom coded. Bear in mind that things that are used in the community all have issue queues, and there's patches that are constantly being rolled in to um, improve both the security and the functionality of these modules or themes, right? But that is not the case for your custom code. <laughs> so all the benefits of working in the community do not apply. So if you are custom coding something, buyer beware, big red flags, super code review. Tag your releases to help isolate changes and do frequent releases. If you're not doing frequent uh, releases, the bigger the batch size of your change, the bigger risk it is to your system. So if you isolate them into smaller chunks, you can easily, more easily roll them back or uh, log what is happening or, or find it, do some debugging, right? So I would really strongly recommend small batch releases. And by the way, update your code regularly. I know this is, this is probably like the, the lamest um, security recommendation that you've probably heard since you know, Drupal was um, just a brain thought in Dries' head decades ago. But just update your code on a regular basis, um, please. <laughs> One of the really important points, especially for us at Civic Actions, we believe very heavily in Agile uh, practices and policies. And Agile is really about continuous learning and doing that through iteration. The only way that you're really going to learn to iterate and improve on your infrastructure is through automation. It provides the perfect <laughs> DevOps opportunity <laughs> for you know, applying practice to what you've learned. So I'd strongly recommend that you try to automate as much as you can to help avoid manual mistakes. Greg provided a lot of really useful tools in his talk about integrating with Travis CI, doing uh, PHP CS code inspection, all these other things that can be super, super useful for catching mistakes that you might otherwise make. And it's all automated. And I hope most of you, at least in the room, are aware of Drush, that you can help to use a tool like Drush or Drupal Console or PHP CS and others to help perform this automation within a bash script, or you could put it in Jenkins, or use CI tools that are integrated with GitHub. Any of these sort of things are cool. Automation, man. Automation. All right. Coder modules. So let's talk about some different ways that we can indeed bring this automation to, to light. Um, I want to scan my code for the best practices. The coder module ships with, um, uh, with Drupal 8 uh, around uh, specific extensions for PHP code sniffer. Okay? So that gives you the away, uh, a way to audit and run scans against uh, your code using this tool. And this can be integrated with your CI system. Right? If you, hopefully you have a CI system. And if you don't, you could maybe just write a quick script and tell before you submit a pull request or anything, do a quick audit and see if you're actually you know, meeting the needs. The hack module. Um, Drupal does you know, have a bunch of best practices that most of the people that have been doing it for years understand. But if you're new to Drupal, you might be inclined to go and make some changes to core. You might be inclined to go and make some changes to a contrib module. And you might not be generating patches. You might not be giving it back. Um, you might be new to it. That's fine. This module here is a gate check for making sure that you are not tampering with code that should not be tampered with. 
So it will do scanning and it'll compare it with what's uh, on Drupal.org. I think it uses some checksum model. I can't remember exactly. But um, it goes and does that scan and it'll give you a report of every single area in your code base that has been tampered with. Kind of nice. This one is DevOps focused, but really doesn't affect the code a whole lot. Um, backup and migrate. So um, most hosting infrastructures really provide a lot of good tools and things for doing backups. I know that is common with Aqua and Pantheon and Platform and many of the other big vendors that are around in the space. But suppose you have you know, your own hosting and you want to take you know, DevOps into your own hands. Backup and migrate might be a great tool for you. So I want regular backups of my site. And the solution is this module allows you to perform regular backups. It can do it on cron as well. And it will be very helpful for you to have this if your system ever gets compromised. Because you can go back and restore it to a known good state. That's good DevOps. Right? And, and by the way, test this, please. <laughs> if you're using it, actually run it to see if your process works. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard of the horror stories when someone's like, I've got these amazing backup you know, procedures in my organization. And then the thing gets completely hacked and they don't work. All right, environment. Um, again, not a big infrastructure person, but I'm going to do my best to fake it today. Hello. Securing your infrastructure is equally as important as securing your Drupal system. Yes. Even I know that, okay? So do it. Uh, there are many, many, many solutions that can mitigate attacks before your Drupal system even gets communicated with. Before it ever even bootstraps or loads, you can mitigate attacks from the infrastructure. So what are some general tips for this? First and foremost, in your DevOps processes, make sure you're using a multi-environment code workflow. You should never, ever, ever be pushing code directly to production. Use multiple environments, at least a dev stage prod kind of thing. Um, I tend to prefer more of the on-demand style container environments because you could spin things up by branch. But always be providing things in a, as another environment outside of production that you could bring down the production database and files, test your new code and your changes before it goes live. Huge. Another really easy one is use of a CDN. That can serve as a great mediation point before your Drupal site is invoked. And it often works really well with Drupal's caching systems as well. So that can serve as a mediation point to be a firewall to your Drupal system. It can catch so much crap. Uh, people trying to run SQL injection against your site that it'll catch all those requests and it's not even going to go to Drupal. It's going to stop. It's going to say, oh, this looks pretty crazy. And by the way, these systems, the really popular CDN systems, are constantly evolving with machine learning algorithms. They are always proactively applying new security measures. And you get that just by installing it. So totally do it. Worth it. Very easy. And then this one's a little bit more, more kind of technical or possibly outside of the realm of possibility. But whenever you have um, really good, robust auditing, your site's going to be generating a lot of data. And that data is going to be in these logs, right? One of the great ways that you could, uh, great tools that you could leverage if you have good data coming out of your system is something like Splunk or Elk to build log analysis tools. And that will give you both the ability to go and inspect and regularly audit and analyze your data, but also gives you the ability to have triggers of things that may be bad signs for you. So for instance, if your performance is hitting a certain threshold in your logs or catching it, you may be able to prevent your site from going down. And these tools will enable that to happen before you have a problem. Other general tips, um, definitely use cloud-based environments if you can. They just have so many like architectural advantages that it's just so worth it, and they're disposable. You could just destroy those things left and right, and they work like a charm. 
So, you know, if you ever have an issue and one server is misbehaving, spin another one up. It would be great. And you should definitely consider looking at a failover environment if you ever get the chance, uh, because if you do get hacked, indeed, you want to be able to just flip a switch to something that's of higher fidelity and you'd be good to go. That could be multi-regional, um, or it could be just, you know, even another server at the ready. Um, you know, and, and hardware does go down. That still happens. So it's good to do that. And I, already, I guess I already stole my thunder earlier. Test your backup plans. Yeah. Uh, thank you, guys. We did make it through all the, <laughs> the slides, and I almost did it. I have a couple acknowledgments I want to just do really quick. First and foremost, civic actions. If you are not familiar with us, like, man, what an awesome place. Um, really, really great company. Uh, you know, we promote openness, agile, and DevOps. Those are the big things that we're really into, and we are a heavy, heavy player in the Drupal community. We love Drupal. We try to give back as much as possible. I want to thank the Drupal community because every single thing that I had up here was made possible because of them. Uh, we're, we're truly, really standing on the shoulders of giants <laughs> in this space, and that is not a joke. Uh, I want to thank all the folks at Stanford here that have put on an amazing camp. I'm like the last one to go here, so I can do that on their behalf. I don't see any uh, red shirts in here, so I'll have to thank them later. But uh, the organizers, other presenters, you guys were amazing. And anyone who participated here today, really thank you. And uh, again, I have Peter Willannon to thank because I did pull some of the ideas uh, from CORE into this presentation, thanks to him. Thank you so much. I'll take questions.